My name is Summer Kim Lee. I'm really happy to be here. Um, and I, I want to join everyone else in thanking Marcy, Elisa, Eddie, Ellen, and Chloe um, for all of their hard work in making this happen. Um, it's happened with such ease that I think for all of us is really rare. So this, um, so really grateful. Um, and uh, so I'm here to introduce the speakers for the panel on gender and sexuality. Um, in the interest of time, like others, I'm just briefly introducing everyone as they come on stage and um, you can read their full bios um, through the QScan online. Um, so please welcome Melissa Ho, curator of the Smithsonian American Art Museum, Viet Le, artist, curator, and associate professor of history, art, and visual culture program, and artist Catalina Oyoung. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, first, my sincere thanks to Marcy and Elisa for including me in this incredible, inspiring weekend. Um, thank you to all of the presenters. I really have been learning so much, and I'm just really grateful to be here. And uh, finally, I want to thank, uh, join everybody in thanking Eddie Dye and Ellen O and all the volunteers who are making everything run so beautifully. I'm going to admit right away that I haven't stuck strictly to the brief of discussing a single image. Um, and if you're familiar with Zhang Quanji, you perhaps understand why. But I'm starting with this image because it was the first Bai Zun that I ever encountered. And um, I thank Margot Machida for this because I saw it on the cover of the exhibition catalog, Asia America, Identities in Contemporary Asian American Art, curated by Margot in 1994, one of her many groundbreaking projects. This was the first exhibition at the Asia Society in New York to focus on Asian American issues. And I have to admit, um, I did not see the show at that time. And I'm not certain exactly where and when I came across the book. Uh, most likely in the late 90s, perhaps in the very early 2000s. It was definitely before the internet, definitely uh, when such a discovery still felt quite rare and precious, because I do recall the shock of recognition that I felt encountering this photograph for the first time. Zun's posturing uh, resonated deeply with me. I knew immediately that we had lived experience in common, and I was inspired by his defiant and witty response to a world dominated by definitions and categories of race, gender, nation that had been defined and imposed by others. Oh. For those not familiar with the artist, uh, Zhang Quanqi was born in 1950 in Hong Kong to parents who had fled Shanghai after the end of the Chinese Communist Revolution the year before. His family immigrated to Canada in 1966, and after studies in Vancouver, Montreal, and Paris, Zun moved to New York City in 1978. He quickly became a fixture of the burgeoning graffiti and performance art scene centered around Club 57 in the East Village. He was a contributing photographer for the alternative weekly, The Soho News, and he was a close friend and collaborator with Keith Haring, Kenny Scharf, and Magnuson and other artists. Zun died of AIDS-related complications in March of 1990. In his most well-known work, the East-West series, Zun poses in a guise he referred to as the ambiguous ambassador. He began employing this persona in his photographs in 1979, following a real-life incident in which he wore a Mao suit, which he had acquired at a store in Montreal, to dine with his visiting parents at the restaurant Windows on the World. To the family's surprise, Zun was effusively welcomed at the restaurant. In the eyes of the maitre d', his racial features seemed to authenticate his costume. And he was, greeted, uh, he was greeted, according to his sister, Muna Zun, quote, like a VIP, like a dignitary. Paradoxically, by allowing his identity to be read reductively through his race, and by accentuating rather than attempting to mitigate his visible foreignness, Zun found a way to achieve the status of honored guest. Donning the Mao suit thereafter became a playful, self-protective maneuver. 
While the costume did not prevent Zun's multifaceted and transnational identity from being misinterpreted, it did allow him some control of the manner of misreading. To those who perceived the levity with which he wore the suit, something significant was revealed about Zun's uh, irreverent camp sensibility. The dissonance of his appearance, the fact that the suit looked both natural and unnatural on him, was not effaced but highlighted, at least to the knowing beholder. But when people were unable to see past type, the misconception did not come at the cost of Zun's psychic humiliation. Though the costume of his race typically invited an undesirable set of associations in 1970s America, when adapted to the role of visiting official, it afforded Zun a distinct social cachet. Zun easily exploited this friendly side of Orientalism on the occasion of the Met Gala in 1980, which coincided with an exhibition celebrating the court costume of the last imperial Chinese dynasty, the Qing. As had been the case at Windows on the World, Zun's race in combination with his suit proved powerfully suggestive, and no one challenged him when he crashed the party despite the ID badge clipped to his pocket flap that clearly read, visitor, slut for our art. <laughs> Accompanied by a camera assistant, Zun arranged himself at the top of the grand staircase and speaking English and French, proceeded to interview and photograph the guests, many of whom mistook him for an official representative of the People's Republic of China. As Moon and Zun attests, and Zun's photographs seem to confirm, quote, the party guests were totally intrigued by this Chinese man. They were fascinated by this person who was from the East who wore the official uniform, unquote. Yves Saint Laurent purportedly complimented Zun on his French and asked whether he had served in the Chinese embassy in Paris. A Met staff member told Zun, I'm glad you appreciated the show. That makes it twice as exciting. If Zun's appearance at the party seemed natural to his fellow attendees, the photographs tell a different story. Unfolding across multiple images, the constructed nature of Zun's performance becomes clear. In some shots, he poses rigidly, his expression impassive and formal. More often, his face and body are animated and open, at odds with his Chinese communist persona. In addition to this cultural ambiguity, Zun enacted gender ambiguity, cloaked as he was in quasi-military masculine attire, even as his ID badge proclaimed him a slut and his interview questions focused on the feminine topics of dresses and designers. Gender subversion plays a role in Zun's art not easily separated from his engagement with stereotypes of Chineseness. As a gay Asian man, Zun was subject to double feminization in the context of the West. As playwright David Hen Henry Huan describes, the West has always cast Asia in feminine terms. Quote, the West thinks of itself as masculine, big guns, big industry, big money. So the East is feminine, weak, delicate, poor, but good at art and full of inscrutable wisdom, the feminine mystique, unquote. The Mao suit was well known at this time for being worn by both men and women in the People's Republic of China. Sun's use of it could therefore be considered a parodic flaunting of his marked status as foreign and Chinese, but also male and or female. The supposedly unisex Mao suit nonetheless conforms to conventions of masculine dress. It is geometric, unembellished, plain in color and utilitarian. Perhaps then, Zhang could also be said to have restaged the communist cadre type as gay clone. As Richard Myard has written, clone culture of the 1970s refers to, quote, a highly codified mode of self-presentation whereby gay men appropriated the roles and attributes of mythic American masculinity, unquote. Zhang could not fit the Western masculine ideal of the cowboy, the cop, the construction worker, but he could ape the role of stern Chinese Communist Party official. It is in this mode that we find the ambiguous ambassador making a cameo appearance in the magazine Christopher Street on a page entitled Everyone Likes Evan. 
In this grid of 16 photo booth photographs by Herman Costa, Evan in the striped shirt poses with a different man, and in one case a dog, in each frame. While the others embrace and smile for the camera, Zun appears tough and expressionless, his eyes hidden behind dark glasses. Only one other friend of Evan adopts the same posture, a mustachioed cop clone, also unsmiling, wearing shades, and his body cloaked in an impersonal uniform. We know, of course, that Zun's deadpan pose here is momentary. This is not the exuberant bon vivant that friends and family invariably describe. The guise of the ambiguous ambassador was for Zun a calculated artistic strategy, but also lived experience. His practice was precipitated by and embedded in live social relations. Refusing to be anything other than ambiguous, he pursued an identity characterized by powerful multivalence and indeterminacy. Zun's queer play with normative standards reveals the absurdity of essences such as race, gender, ethnicity, and nation. In so doing, he and others of his generation opened up new possibilities for those of us who have followed. For it is not just someone like the multiply displaced son who is incompatible with hyper-intelligible social categories. Each of us occupy an identity that is vexed and constantly changing. Thank you. Many thanks to the AAAI team. Marcy, Elisa, Ellen, Edie, Chloe, Veronica, Gordon, Mark, Jerome, among many others, and all of you. Because of all of you, this feels historic. Because of all of you, because of all of you, this feels like coming home. Let's maintain this magic across our communities. One, hot Jesus, after death, AD, before Christ, BC, before common era, BCE, BDE. Two, this is my mom and me before, before and after, in between, before the wars end, after the Americans, in between living and dying. Take two. It takes two. This is mom and I before we left Vietnam. Look back. And you'll turn into a pillar of salt, Lot's wife is forewarned. I never looked back. I never noticed this photograph's background, like literally. In the background, there's a temple. As a child, my parents took me to ancestral altars, worship, say hello to the grad dead grandparents. I'd always get physically sick after they stopped. Hungry ghosts? It had to stop. Throughout my life, these mystery illnesses would come back and come back. They said buried emotions, spirits manifest physically. Throughout my life, family members would be mysteriously ill. When living in Cambodia in my 30s, my mom went batshit crazy. My children are dead. Mom, I'm on the phone talking to you. My children are dead! Schizophrenia, war trauma. Check the box, A, B, C, D, E. W, W, J, D. What would Jesus do? Then she got better. Then my sister before and after and in between. Was this a family curse or a gift? A pathology or a power? After the war, after becoming an American, in between living and dying. What's in the background? I searched for my grandfather's spirit, one of Gaudai's founders, a Vietnamese shaman who engaged in spirit seances, still a common practice today. My current film and book project starts with Gao Dai, a syncretic, egalitarian, Vietnamese, indigenous religion. It is Vietnam's third largest religion with six million followers in Vietnam, Cambodia, the US, Europe, Australia. 
My family's story is part of a larger diasporic and decolonial story. Gao Dai was founded partly as an anti-French, anti-colonial movement in 1926. Gao Dai merges Eastern and Western philosophies and religious beliefs, such as, um, and figures such as Buddha, Mary, Muhammad, Jesus, among others. Three, queer mise en scène, mistranslations, and CNN travel. About 15 years ago, while working as a research assistant slash translator for USC religious studies scholar Janet Hoskins at a Gaudai temple, the mediums would ask me at end's day, Yi thương tung sao cho lại nhé? Cutie, come back next week. Uh, is it me or is this temple um, cruisy? Look back and you'll turn into a pillar of salt. I didn't come back. But I've learned since then that queer Vietnamese spirit mediums are common. The sacred and the mundane, Hanoi-based artist and activist Wing Ti's 2007 documentary, Love Man, Love Woman, follows queer master Lu Ngoc Duc as he gossiped on a motorbike, running errands, and as he embodies a dozen different spirit mediums um, different deities, including warriors, kings, princesses, across time and space in music field ceremonies. Speaking of bombastic sonic ceremonies, the Propeller Group's 2014 experimental film, The Living Need Light, The Dead Need Music, connects fantastical South Vietnamese funerary traditions to global South traditions, a call and response. In between living and dying, the spirits beckon us. Mother Goddess Religion, or Dao Mao, an older practice which started in the 16th century, was banned by socialist Vietnam as a superstitious practice until 1987. In 2016, UNESCO deemed it an intangible cultural world heritage. Today, busloads of non-worshippers can choose to see Vietnamese water puppets or stage Mother Goddess ritual extravaganzas. Transcendence and Tourism. CNN Travel notes that, quote, during Mother Goddess worship, hao dong, loosely meaning to mount the medium is the most important step, unquote. As a side note, hao dong also referred to hao bong, literally meaning serving the reflections. Is it coincidence that bong is also Vietnamese slang for gay or queer? Note to self, more etymological research. More CNN travel. Quote, during the ceremony, mediums and their assistants will don bright costumes, make offerings to Buddha, perform folk dances, and petition the goddess to descend and possess their bodies. When spirits have entered the body, the medium will appear to change personalities. Unquote. CNN travel may blur mother goddess worship with lendang, even an older practice of spirit mediumship in which everyday practitioners can embody other deities, female office workers, Corporate office workers may channel bearded, sword-wielding, kick-ass generals. Cis male identified banmi vendors may embody one of the super kick-ass Jung sisters who overthrew Chinese imperialists in 40 AD. In all these traditions, before, after, in between, after the common era, Gao Dai, Mother Goddess, Lin Dang, the bounds of time, gender, desire, and the divine is ruptured. Four, as a queer, disabled Vietnamese boat refugee, my practice engages spirituality, sexuality, healing. My experimental film and academic book project highlights contemporary transnational artists working through multi-sensory mediumship, expanding definitions of trance, trans, T-R-A-N-S, and medium. I focus on queer feminist Artists use different corporeal aspects, sight, sound, touch, smell, taste, to embody spiritual traditions, ranging from Asian indigenous shamanism to black Atlantic religions. I assert that mediumship comprises transcendent states that strategically move the politics of identity and geography, moving between and beyond time and space and personhood. I argue that these artists as spirited mediums Shift global north-centric diets of pathology, power, 
male, female, mind, body. Five. Ah, but oh, what a body on this hearty. Hashtag WWJD, hashtag Slip for Art, a poem channeling. What would Jesus do? I'll dance, dance, dance with my hands, hands, hands above my head, 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 like Jesus said. Dance, dance, dance. He was a slim, dead, dainty man of about 20. He lay with one leg bent beneath him, his jaw in his throat, his face neither expressive or inexpressive. One eye was shut, the other eye was a star-shaped hole. Who will die for whose sin, they say. It's the skin we're in, they say. I say, flay me alive for your transgressions, my love, love lust, bloodlust, not just a piece of meat. Pope Francis, Francis's bacon, Francis bacon, cross raw meat boxes, lamb hull, crossfire, my love is on fire. I spied them in the jungles. And flies and flies and flies, hello cadavers, crisp lardon, Lord Francis, father of empiricism, who is father of empires? Oh, thou art, Lord of the flies, histories, anamorphic, anathemas, young blood, forever young, flesh rotting in the heat, am you, heartbeat camouflage. He was a young American, young American. He was a young American. Your ale, your pale El Greco fingers outstretched, splayed in tender supplication. Hail Marys and machetes. Your heat, cold, la mort, la mort. Cold wars, hot peace, a crown of thorns, crown chakra. Time flies, crux of the matter, never mind. Mind over matter. And ya am. Souls parachute, stuck in treetops, scenes of absolution, crucifixion on high. Oh, high rises. Rise, rise, rise. Our absolute absolution. Celestial concrete firmament. Drown, drown, drown. Dance, dance, dance. Suicide, crucifixion. Facts. Our hands above our heads in prayer and penitence. I'm above treetops. I'm enthroned. Your memory embalmed in mausoleums of desire. Thank you. Hi, I'm Catalina. Um, I'm very grateful to be here, so thank you. Um, okay, I was kind of resisting um, showing one of my own works, but then I went for it. So um, these are uh, two of a series of work uh, collectively titled Pronoun of Love. Um, I was, you know, thinking about a pronoun beyond its most timely social application um, as being a stand-in for a subjective position, for a subjectivity um, that creates a condition of being addressable to me, the pronoun evokes the eroticism of encounter, the violation of perception, and the ecstasy of recognition. Prono pronoun of love, the phrase, is borrowed from Lisa Robertson's book, Magenta Soul Whip, wherein she writes, sometimes in Latin, through history, empire, eros, and everything around and in between. The text plaques um, that are part of the piece are excerpts from Jean Rhys's 1966 novel, Wide Sargasso Sea, which is um, a sort of prequel to uh, the Charlotte Bronte book, Jane Eyre. 
um, and provides a backstory for Mr. Rochester's insane wife in the attic. I'll just read the text aloud because I don't think it's super visible. On the left, sneer to the last devil, and on the right, I hated the mountains and the hills, the rivers and the rain. I hated the sunsets of whatever color. I hated its beauty and its magic and the secret I would never know. I hated its indifference and the cruelty which was part of its loveliness. Above all, I hated her. So I am now going to read a syncretic text made up of um, journals, text messages, Instagram captions, and iPhone notes uh, dating from 2019 to this morning. When the 2011 adaptation of Jane Eyre came out, I spent its premiere week sneaking out of high school to catch matinee screenings. This was the one starring Michael Fassbender. I was obsessed with him, as if my adolescent intuition could sense the abuse he had only recently inflicted on his ex-partner, Sunwin Andrews, dragged outside a moving car, thrown over a chair, breaking her ankle and kneecap and rupturing her ovarian cysts. I was 17 and already addicted to whatever it is that coaxes a beaten animal to return home. I knew that this actor and the Mr. Rochester he played to be evil. It was what enticed me about them both. A few years later, wildly in love and dragged sometimes outside a moving car myself, I wanted to make a project collecting literary instances of the moment of falling out of love. I asked widely for contributions. What was I looking for? permutations of emotional severance that I found myself unable to manifest. I acted out, drank too much, screamed, begged forgiveness that was neither due nor warranted. In the 2011 Jane Eyre, Bertha Antoinette Causeway Mason makes a brief appearance on screen, dark and full of sex, falling into Michael Fassbender's arms. My own demon, he calls her, almost lovingly. One chapter of White Sargasso Sea is told from young Rochester's point of view over the period in which his disgust for his new bride, Antoinette, solidifies. In his tirades against her, he conflates her volatile character with Jamaica's tropical climate, her alleged promiscuity and satanic proclivities with a landscape foreign to him. He renames her. I find his hatred nonsensical, familiar, and infectious. It makes me abhor, yet long for my worst love affairs, itinerary of errors, savage transactions of negation. The death of love I sought years ago was not about the love between lovers, but about sundering a relationship to history. In one conversation, flailing through verbiage, I describe my creatures as alienated subjects, by which I think I meant eyeless. Years ago, when I had my humanity rent from me, I pictured it, my humanity, as a missing eye thieved away in the night. I wrote down a bit of this analogy, wanting to name a thing that remained hurtful because it remained formless. But when my readers demanded more, more story, more image, more context, we want to see, smell, feel the journey of this eye, I gave up. Yes, these creatures are fetuses. The dream of baby embodies nothing to me. Maternity, womanness, embed as firmly in the membrane of alienation as power, peace, magnanimity. You punish yourself for the thing you do not have and cannot even bring yourself to want. The sublimity of the unborn thing, brimful and totally unconsenting, the world egg feeding everyone and everything to equivocal end. I spent today unraveling toward an impermissible dimension. Old violations bubble up and hope remains blinding, literally unbearable. Negative space is the gap in what is known, visible, our inheritance, 
Negative space is what you pass through to become flayed. The hazards of choosing one addiction because the other, eros, is annihilating. Hazard of self-preservation, leaving without goodbye, unlacing the hand. Hazard of waking alone on the floor, thinking, I chose this. I had power, and I chose this. Hazard of false equivalency, hatred of God, spitting in the face of what you are dealt. Sexuality makes a whole in truth. When I say cognitive dissonance, it is seldom so much a judgment as an attempt to name an abstraction of longing and fear stretched to its limit. In the middle of the night, I have to pee, so I go to the bathroom and look in the mirror. What gazes back? The face of a wolf. No, a puppy, a flat-nosed, wide-faced puppy, a puppy named Ming Ming, jester of the Chinese court, a puppy with a stupid, smiling face. Are we daft? When did we lose what made us unhinged? I am a puppy. I am a B-word. I am a muse, and muse is the lowest rung. To be a muse, you have to be an idiot. To be a muse, you must cultivate egos, not ruin them. The ruination model of intervention has become the main thoroughfare to that slippery grail of agency. When I asked my grandmother how she met my grandfather and if she had wanted offspring before she suffered to bear them, she wailed with laughter. She laughed at me and threw herself on the ground. Am I to conclude that she lived her life without agency? My grandfather, it is 2019 and they are suctioning out his lungs. He is gurgling in pain. One nurse holds his mouth open, the other holds a clear tube. Blood tinted liquid chugs slowly through it. His jowls are bloated. When they are done suctioning, my Yi and I approach the bed and Yi tries to take his hands, which he is clenching hard. One nurse says he scratched her yesterday. I impotently rub the back of his forearm, which feels paper light. He doesn't seem to recognize me, but maybe he does and can't express it. Maybe he can't see me at all. One of his eyes, his right one, is ringed completely milky blue. His hands have shrunk to the size of mine, and they shake. I watch my Yi's hands holding his hand, seeing the fingernails are the same oval shape. My mother has the same fingers, and I. All of our hands come from him. Now he is gazing out the window. His eyes are glassy and full of wonder. He used to build wooden furniture. His hands are soft now like moist tofu skin. Holding his hand is like holding a lover's hand, that tenderness I miss so much. I have recently lost a lover. It feels perverse to think about intimacy in this context. I can only imagine how my grandfather's entire body hurts. I wonder if he will recognize me by the end of the week. These things, these farewell rites, are always more for the living than for the dying. Everything on his face looks out of proportion. Forehead smaller, nose flatter, eyes smaller and farther apart, chin weaker, cheeks wider, the consequence of living horizontally, mouth like the gaping jaws of a paddlefish. The longing in his eyes, what is it for? Thank you. So um, thank you again to Melissa, Viet, and Catalina for sharing such rich readings and material. I've been really excited for the opportunity to respond. Um, so I'll do my best. Um, so I want to start by revisiting uh, briefly the beginning of the 1998 anthology Q&A, Queer in Asian America, edited by Alice Y. Hom and David Eng, um, uh, which offers a consideration of a particular scene. So a friend of Haman Ang's, quote, a short-haired, butch-looking Asian-American lesbian, end quote, is seen by two white women washing her hands in a public woman's restroom. Upon seeing her, one woman says to the other, quote, oh, whatever, he probably doesn't read English, end quote. Instead of being chased out, threatened, or harassed, Haman Ang's friend is merely dismissed as someone in the wrong place. 
Eng and Hom write, quote, in this restroom as a public site where dominant images of emasculated Asian American men and hyper heterosexualized Asian American women collide, the Asian American lesbian disappears, end quote. So within the public restroom as the site of gender trouble, Asian butch masculinity passes and is passed over, inconvenient in its presumed foreignness. Um, this friend is not perceived as confounding cis heteronormative categories of gender so much as by way of Asian racialization, she is further subsumed by them, made to fit within pre-existing dominant modes of legibility and representational regimes. Hong and Eng's friend's queer gender presentation does not translate, and what causes unease in the telling of this anecdote is that in the moment of mistranslation, her butchness is assimilated and normalized, evacuated of queerness, and relegated to the realm of cis-hetero masculinity. It is not just the disappearance and erasure of the Asian American lesbian that Hom and Eng take issue with here. It's also that through this misreading, the Asian butch lesbian is no longer the deviant, resistant, queerly queerly held subject with claims to other radical worlds and futures. So I wonder how we might revisit this anecdote, which is not just work out of an assumption of an Asian Americanness um, or a queer Asian Americanness constituted by lack, but rather by its misrecognition. What can be done in the face of that misrecognition becomes the question that I want to think about here through these presentations. Um, so I do not offer this reading to cast doubt on the offense and harm of misrecognition or to overlook the importance and magnitude of being seen, read, and desired as how one presents and identifies as queer, mask, or otherwise. Rather, I want to consider what it is that we want and what Melissa describes as the manner of the misreading explored, um, which I think is in, in all of these presentations and artworks, in the ways that one is mistaken for something else, for someone else, for another kind of person, for another kind of object or thing. So it's not that this misrecognition is inevitable or something we must settle for, but that perhaps there is room for the capaciousness within misrecognition, the space and time for one to get away with what they want precisely when someone is looking. Um, so I'm thinking also of earlier when um, uh, uh, artist Tiffany Sia talked about identifying as an artist rather than an activist and what you can covertly get away with under that name. Right? So th while someone is looking, what can happen? Um, so Melissa, Viet, and Catalina have presented moments when communication has failed, when too much or not enough has been assumed, when a representation has gone awry, only sometimes willfully on purpose, and in other times not by one's own choosing, um, but instead under impositions and constraints, both violent and not, of the limited knowledge, imagination, and actions of another. Such encounters with others present the question, Viet asks, quote, is this a pathology or power, end quote. How does one disidentify with what has been imposed and projected onto oneself? How does one render the pathological so often deemed the queer, the feminine, the emasculated, the alien into its own power? And to be clear, I don't mean the kind of empowerment that uplifts a subject and transcends difference or kind of further contains and shores up a subject, but rather the force of a generative, unruly creative capacity for animation, experimentation, and play that provokes a multitude of misreadings. So this could be understood perhaps as the power to navigate what um, Hentai yesterday reminded us is that structural demand, um, demand for and of representation bound up with institutional sites that absorb and incorporate difference under the guise of scarcity and the expectation of our gratitude. And again here I'm also thinking of Dorothy Wing's reading of um, being grateful. Right? So I think this is the point from which we enter in a conversation about Asian American art and aesthetic practices that are neither interested in shoring up stable categories of gender and sexuality to which Asian American subjects have historically been denied and excluded from, nor invested in working only out of an assumption of lack and invisibility that conflates deviance with resistance, abundance with radicality, and representation with material change. So as Viet Nguyen wrote in his first book, the valorizing discourse of the resistant bad Asian American subject, so often recuperable um, uh, as radical or deviant and resistant, um, disavows how some Asian Americans, as Candace Chu has also pointed out, embrace the model minority myth for their own ends. Both Nguyen and Chu are skeptical of easy idealizations of the figure of the bad Asian insofar as they enable some to, quote, ignore the contradictions and excesses that make the bad subject amenable to discipline by dominant society, end quote. Um, and also how to enable some to disavow how capital has transformed what constitutes Asian American racial identity and solidify an identitarian category rather than productively de destabilize it. 
Um, so I gesture to how these presentations touch upon misrecognitions that need not work in service to legible affirming narratives of resistance and do not promise an abundance of deviant representation that feel uncompromisingly cathartic and good. Here things are messier, um, or to recall Quang Chi, um, more slutty. And while there have been more crucial studies of the emasculization of um, Asian American men and the fetishistic hypersexualization and ornamentation of Asian American women, um, I want to think about how responding to such gendered, sexualized, racial stereotypes require refusal and resistance, um, but also other ways of inhabiting the categories we live in and pass through. Um, other forms, sensations, and desires that do not care to correct or assert one's own authenticity and inclusion um, and do not assume that arriving at the bad subject um, as queer otherwise is all that we were after in the first place. What else is summoned, for instance, when Viet describes how his mother hears things others can't or when wonders what is an illness or a spirit or in the lingering question of whether or not a temple is cruisy, whether or not a background and one's own background of landscape, terrain, and personal history is worth looking back to um, for what had previously been missed. Viet's writing um, and, and performance lecture that shuttles us through and across collapsed time before and after and in between formally takes on the mediumship enabled in the worship of Gaudai, um, where the everyday practitioner living the mundane becomes the sacred, pushing beyond the bounds of personhood, collapsing time and blending bodies in sensuous ways that attune the body to the rush of such cruisy feeling, um, cruisy feeling of brushing up against a strange other, different from oneself. Like the everyday practitioner of um, Gao Dai, uh, Quang Shi shapeshifts into the ambiguous ambassador who, as Melissa describes, welcomes and cultivates his own mistaken identity in order to become an honored, mysterious guest in what might otherwise be hostile spaces among such elite company. His mouth suit feels like another kind of skin, as that which looks both natural and unnatural, lending Quang Chi as a queer figure in his own frame, a mobility under the guise of upholding good intentional um, international relations, of being the diplomatic subject just passing through, visiting and crashing parties, striking up conversations before ghosting his hosts who were also unknowing guests privy to his own performance. While I have attended to the manner of misreadings, I want to also think about their matter, which is to say the source material of illegible bodies not reactivated through iterations of new materialist thought that cannot account for history and difference, um, but also not confined to the visuality of the human figure alone, to an expectation that my minoritarian artists work um, should represent the body of the other made consumable, put on spectacular display, provoking an onlooker's sympathy, disgust, fascination, and desire. Um, Catalina's pronoun of love is composed of a series of fetal figures um, and alienated objects uh, turned upside down, contorting with a backbend or neatly with cold precision sliced in half at the torso. Um, some are smooth, but others are textured with abject materials that refuse to leave the body clinging like hair. Their puppy school heads are turned to face mirrors, hung on the wall where a viewer might catch a glimpse of themselves, along the skulls that gaze introspectively into their own reflection, alluding to a hollow, opaque interiority we cannot access. These bodies are defamiliarized objects, abstract forms that uneasily recall the violences they must have suffered to become so misshapen in the first place. There is no stable Asian American subject to be found in these works. No subject that might recover or give proof of corrective inclusion um, and something that I think um, has been cautioned with in, in Suzette Min's work on Asian American art and curatorial practice. So they also do not assert and inherently, um, at the same time, they don't inherently uh, assert, assert an inherently radical deviance to be claimed as one's own. Um, to address how Asian American art might cr uh, critically engage with the bounds of rigid categories of gender and sexuality is to consider the promiscuity of the visitor and the slut for art, um, like Quang Chi, the receptivity of the medium ready to take in others, and the inscrutable defamiliarization of abstract objects, a series of misrecognitions that cannot promise a politics wholly good or bad, a figure neither complicit nor resistant. Instead, in the manner and matter of misreading, the works here lead us astray, seducing us through time to a gala, to another body, another person, and another unfamiliar shape and reflection. 
Here too is where I return to the phrase, I am you, you are too, um, as something we can think about here again, as an utterance marking the moment of proximal relation that risks the misreading of being mistaken for another, of imposing oneself too forcefully, of misrecognizing oneself in and for another. Um, so I'm excited for the, the, the Q&A and for us to talk about your works alongside each other, so thank you. So a question I had um, for both, and then I can pass this mic on because I think we're, okay, um, is I'm, I'm noticing that the, the figure um, is visible or takes place or is present in, in all three of the presentations, whether as the alienated object or the kind of solo figure in East meets, East meets West or the kind of figure with others in the party photos or celebrity panel or in um, your own archival photos. So I'm wanting to think about um, how the representation of the figure is something that you're thinking about in all three. Um, and this can also even take into account the kinds of like multiplicity of mediumship too. Just would love to hear that across. I can go. There's also in these Guangxi images such as pathos and joy and camp all in one. So I'm really interested in this idea of figure and ground what do we foreground, right? Um, and what do we put in the background? So as in the case of my mom's image, I never actually looked at this temple, which was so haunting. But just in general, this idea of the figure, uh, figure of haunting, this idea of self, and this idea of non-self. So yourself, we have this idea within ethnic studies, area studies, you know, what constitutes the self, the political self, the body politic, right? but I'm also really interested in what happens when that dissolves, right? So Judith Butler talks about grief. We often think about grief as this dissolution or this isolation, but then she says that grief, vulnerability can be a site of solidarity, of coming together. So how do we dissolve what we think, especially now, in terms of what we think about of our own individual selves? And then also just formally thinking about positivity or the positive and the negative. So oftentimes with an enlightenment positivist rhetoric, there's this uh, focus on the figure, right? This lone subject, but then within other representational tropes, Eastern landscape paintings, of course, the negative, the ground is really the subject and the figure is actually minuscule. So how do we really rupture? It's not one or the other, of course, but what is the ground we stand on? You know, where is Asia? Where is Asia America? Um, what do we figure, what do we reconfigure? Um, it's such a big question, and you know, as someone who makes objects, um, I feel like there is a time where every other month I was undergoing some kind of crisis around representation. Um, and even the, the fundamental question of like, what, what is allowed? Or like, should I be allowed to represent anything? Um, and so I think there's a lot to be said for abstraction and, you know, that's been talked about. But for me, it's like the figure and the representational is a thing I can't get away from. And I think it has to do with my own pleasure um, and my physical relationship to uh, transforming material. I think there's a relationship to... Um, votive objects uh, and, and the primal quality of those and my, um, the materials that I tend to use also sort of um, like go back or follow that lineage of soft woods and beeswax and plaster. Um, and so I think like there, there's an aspect of like permissiveness that I had to like carve out for myself um, to, to let myself, to, embrace this fraught um, dance or choreography that I have with um, portraying embodiment. Um, and, you know, something that I'm like thinking about loosely and in a very scattered way is like this idea of um, evidence or, or proof and, you know, thinking about the corpus as like a term that um, you know, describes both a body and uh, like text or, you know, it's some kind of 
um, evidence. Um, and I think often in my figures, I'm thinking about like how how do I represent something that refuses um, to to offer proof? And I, I I appreciate you mentioning that you're you're wanting to insist on your own pleasure and thinking about the handling of the materials um, that you work with, um, and also in terms of how it is that you question the representation of that pleasure. Um, but I, th I think it gets across the, the point brought up around um, Kuang Chi's photos too, which is that there's like a joy and play um, in the kind of, sol even in the solitary self-portraits that there's, um, e alongside the ones of these guests that, um, that he plays with. And so um, I think something else that points out, I think there's this wariness to think about the body or the corporeal in some ways because it can be so easily captured within certain representational regimes. But I think um, uh, I think what all three of you are also thinking about is actually how it is that that corporeal matter or even like your own gestures, be it in your um, performance lecture, become like a, actually its own kind of insistence of a very material, graspable pleasure that... Um, is exactly as you're saying, still withholds something, right? It's not about a full like self-disclosure. Um, yeah, do you have any questions? We have time for like one, okay. Could I mention something just following on um, Catalina's remarks and yours just now? Um, although I, although we're, we're not seeing any images from this later period that I'm about to reference of Zhang Quanxi's work, uh, it, it, I think um, it's interesting to note that after 1985, these photographs start to change and he is, as a figure in a ground, becomes much harder to see. So in a lot of these earlier ones, he's looming, the camera's looking up and he's looming and looking um, on the scale of architecture or monument. In the later works, he's usually disappearing in a natural landscape and these are the the, the part of the series that he called the expeditionary works. And I think it's a, that it is about sort of turning away. And often he's actually depicted from behind in those images. And Marcy, I thought of that with your slide opening up. Because it's, you can't, not only can you not read his racial features, he's wearing the mouse suit, but you can't discern it. And he's just becoming um, a small soul in this larger natural world. And it did, does feel like um, this exhaustion with the field of social relations and um, you know, just choosing to turn away from that, which I, I think is really uh, a, an interesting um, a final chapter for an artist who, who just was so um, uh, fearless you know, in that field you know, earlier in, in his practice. And to go along, I, I like thinking of, I was also thinking exactly of the images that Marcy showed us and um, the kind of willful blending in the background um, that I think also relates to the way that you talk about the, the reflection of these skulls in the mirror. Like something about the, the, the look of one's own reflection or not seeing one's reflection at all also becomes its own kind of blending, blending in the background, right? Um, and so we have time for one question. Um, so in what specific ways did each individual's work inform your presentation and or the ways in which you are making sense of your work? Uh, this blending, synchronicity, whether intentional or unintentional, so beautifully expresses how our solidarity can create and add to the richness of the body. And then this person said, bless you all with a heart, <laughs> which I feel like I should tell you. <laughs> I'll just really quickly say um, the, I mean, I find Zun's work really inspiring in just the, it's a very straightforward thing, but this attack on all of these fixed binaries of oriental, western, feminine, masculine, alien, at home, is just an important, truth to take into the work um, that I do institutionally. 
This may not actually be an answer to the question, but um, in, in my rot brain, there is like a half formed uh, sentiment about like Munoz and disidentification and, um, you know, with like the Mao Tzu and even some of um, uh, Viet, like your affectations in your performance lecture, like I'm thinking about, you know, it's not trolling, but it's like leaning into a certain, it, it's like um, very uh, self-aware um, presentation. Um, and, uh, you know, that it's like a strategy um, in that to channel both like resentment and sincerity. And I think it's like the sincerity that saves the work um, from, you know, completely dissolving into bitterness. Um, and that is really like uh, the thing as a maker I like try to keep in mind, um, not to lose sight of that. Thank you, Catalina. Uh, I do like the trolling, but <laughs> I'll try to be more sincere. Uh, and I was just thinking also in response earlier to some of what you're saying, this idea of gratitude and minoritarian positions and um, this idea of gifts, right? So I was thinking of Mimi T. Nguyen's Gifts of Freedom, what as you know, immigrants or refugees were expected to be grateful, right? But then this is really a blood debt but in my own work, I think about this idea of gift um, off of Derrida as uh, both present and poison, right? That it's, I like the trolling and sincerity at once, right? That it's a present and poison. And then what happens when, like with Quang Chi, that there's a certain shift that's present and poison, the figure dissolves, the figure is foregrounded, there's a return. So not... Um, I make a face because I'm, I'm not like referencing my book, but I, I'm just thinking about this idea of return. What does it mean when we return again and again? Not a melancholic return, not a loss, but there's something that shifts, right? What do you? What happens when we return to these monuments, right? These celebrities, the Met Gala every single year, which I love, um, and you know this this Met Gala, the Orientalist one in the '70s, right, was re capitulated returns as the Chinese, China through the Looking Glass show recently, and it's still Orientalist. What does it mean when you return to your reflection, right? So I think there's something crucially that shifts, and that's just what I'm advocating for, um, yeah. Thank you so, so much for this really nice discussion and for your work.